We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, in that the left fights the right and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was in fact a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fact! Naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. Yeah. <laughs> We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews, and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship, and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello and welcome to The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood. This sunny Tuesday morning, I'm coming to you live from Downing Street, the site of some excitement. We've just been watching half the cabinet walk through that shiny front door. They'll be having a meeting this morning talking about how to get their party back on track after that seismic vote last night. We've actually just got uh, some more people arriving now. Ben Wallace, the Defence Secretary, is just walking up the street as we talk. We'll be having lots Lots more action coming to you live after the headlines. Very good morning. It's 9.31. I'm Rosie Wright, keeping you up to date on GB News. Well, the Prime Minister is meeting his cabinet this morning as he seeks to move past last night's confidence vote. Boris Johnson has insisted the vote was decisive and said the government can now move on and focus on what really matters to people. Speaking to reporters this morning, Conservative MP Andrea Leadsom wouldn't commit to saying whether Boris Johnson is the right person to lead the party into the next election. The party gave its views yesterday and today is another day we move on and I know the Prime Minister will want to focus on absolutely the priorities of this country. So he's the right man to lead the party into the next election? That's it, thanks. President Zelensky has thanked Boris Johnson for providing Ukraine with the weapons it needs to protect the lives of its people. Russia is pushing forward in its, in its attempt to capture the largest remaining Ukrainian-held city in Luhansk. President Zelensky says despite being outnumbered, Ukrainian forces have every chance of fighting back in the region. Patients with long COVID are faced with often inadequate NHS care as diagnosis and treatment varies hugely across the UK. That's the analysis of the Royal College of Nursing, who they're urging the government to increase investment into the long-term impacts and the treatment of the infection. They say there currently aren't enough specialist services to meet the demand. The government's chief scientific advisor, Sir Patrick Vallance, will receive an honour at Buckingham Palace for helping to lead the UK's battle against coronavirus. Sir Patrick was originally knighted in the 2019 New Year Honours list, but will now be elevated to become a Knight Commander of the Order of the Bath. TV online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now let's head back to the briefing with Tom.
Hello and welcome to The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, live on your TV and your radio. I'm standing here in Downing Street as the last few remaining members of the Cabinet trickle in to that shiny black door where they're holding a Cabinet meeting this morning, trying to shore up the position of the Conservative Party. Of course, 148 Conservative MPs voted no confidence in the Prime Minister last night, while 211 voted confidence in him. That's a split of... 59 to 41. Uh, a smaller proportion of the party backing the Prime Minister than backed Theresa May just uh, three or four years ago, but a, but a larger proportion than backed uh, Margaret Thatcher in 1990 in the vote that uh, eventually brought her down three days later after the Cabinet one by one spoke to her. Well, it doesn't seem like the Cabinet who are meeting today in the building behind me will be doing quite what the Cabinet did in 1990 to Margaret Thatcher. One of the big differences about the situation today does seem to be that the Cabinet is more united around the Prime Minister than previous uh, attempts to remove Prime Ministers, particularly of the Conservative Party, even if the backbench Conservative Party isn't. Now, one theory behind this, of course, is that the Conservative Party has been in power for the last 12 years in one form or another. There are lots of people who have uh, been to the highest points in politics who are now on the back benches who don't potentially see that much of a career in front of them. Potentially, they see themselves as more big beasts who are willing to criticise what comes forward. However, on the other side, clearly there's some division over the direction of the government. Let's not forget this is not just about Partygate, but a U-turning government, a government that seems to have been knocked off course once or twice or even a few more times over the last two years. Well, I'm delighted now to talk through what exactly went on on that uh, pretty eventful day yesterday with Conservative MP Lee Anderson. Uh, welcome to the programme, Lee. I, I, I know you, you backed the Prime Minister yesterday, although you've been a critic of some of the uh, elements of the agenda of this government in the past. Uh, why did Boris Johnson get your vote yesterday? Well, uh, good morning, Tom. Yes, I have been a big uh, critic. I've been quite vocal. That's my job as a backbencher. But look, there's no obvious replacement for, for Boris at the moment. And 14 million people in this country in 2019 voted for Boris Johnson um, and this party and this government. And I think if we're going to get rid of the Prime Minister, it should be up to the British public, not rebels in that place over there, not privileged people like me who sit in a privileged position every day. It was the great British public that voted for Boris and this government. So it should be the great British public that get rid of him if they want to. It's an interesting position looking at all the different people, the different factions that voted against the Prime Minister yesterday. Of course you have people on the left who want to rejoin elements of the European Union, see Boris as a Brexiteer and want him out for that reason. But there's also people on the right of the party who see the Conservatives' agenda of taxing the highest level of, of, of 72 years, who see the constant U-turns, the bowing to media pressure as well, as a government that has to some extent lost control Control. How does the government try and win back those two very disparate factions that seem to be opposing the Prime Minister right now? Well, there's also people amongst the rebels, Tom, that don't like the Rwanda plan. I think that's a great idea. They don't like the fact that we're trying to tackle the, the illegal uh, crossings crisis in the channel. They don't like that. They think it's cool. They don't like, uh, they don't like some of the other things the Prime Minister is doing, which goes down really well in the Red Wall seats. Now, look, the Prime Minister's got a job on his hands. I'm not denying that. He's got to bring the party together. And the way he does that is by starting to deliver on the promises we made in 2019. He's already doing that with, with the levelling up, you know, 62 million, 62.7 million pound in, in Ashfield, seven, 7 million on the uh, on the Future High Streets Fund, possible new railway, two, two new schools, um, two million pound for our a &E at the hospital, a new diagnostic centre. So in places like Ashfield, he is levelling up, but you know that needs to be spread out across the country. And I think once MPC is happening in their areas, then they might be, um, they might come on board a little bit more. But the, you know, Boris is, is a great visionary. Uh, he's a little bit clumsy sometimes with his language. He has made a few mistakes, but you know what? We bought into that when we elected him uh, as the leader of the party. So you know, bear with it. I think we've got two years to. to really get back on track and you know, the, the country will judge him in two years time. 
You're pointing to a lot of things that you're supportive of in Ashfield, the local improvements that are taking place. However, you have said that you need the party to get back on track. Where do you think the party should now change? What should Boris Johnson do to get the party back on track? Well, we need. Well, I mean, the big, the big problem at the moment, Tom, is the cost of living crisis. We need to put more, more, more money back in people's pockets. You know, I'll be quite vocal on the net zero stuff. Not entirely happy with the way we're going about it. Don't disagree, you know, with, with the net zero journey. But I think, you know, the green level, we should need to scrap that. We need to do as much as we possibly can to bring people's fuel bills down. The, the, the you know, the cost of fuel at the pumps is astronomical, nearly two quid a litre at the uh, at the motorway yesterday. We need to sort that out. I think, you know, people will judge us at the next election on not party gate the judges on how much money they've got in the pocket if we get that right we should be okay and to some extent that's an agenda that you'd like to see of the government taxing people less regulating less uh, stop uh, with those green levies uh, stopping levying things on companies as well um, is that going to be likely now? Does the Prime Minister have the moral authority within the party, where 41% of your colleagues voted against him, will he be able to get through those more contentious measures? Well, I, I think he will. And look, like I say, Tom, it's all about cash in people's pockets. You know, we, we, you know, any Prime Minister or any leader of a party that can promise and deliver to put more cash in people's pockets at the next election will, you know, will probably win the election. I think Boris is the man to do that. We need to get back to being the party of low taxation. Make sure people have got a choice when they've got them pound notes in their pocket where they spend it. Look, the, the money's there. We all, we, you know, we all get, a, you know, we get a decent wage in Parliament. You know, I, I'm in a privileged position, so it's all right for me. I'm not struggling with my gas bill or to fill my car up full of petrol. But you know, the vast majority of people out there in places like Ashfield are feeling the pinch at the moment, and it's those people we need to help. Now, of course, there are two by-elections coming up in just a couple, in just three weeks' time. On the 23rd of June, of course, <laughs> one up uh, near, near your patch, up in the Red Wall, but also one down in what the Liberal Democrats are calling the Blue Wall, down in Tiverton. Uh, the Prime Minister's predicted to lose both of those seats. Does that present an element of danger for him uh, in just a month's time? No, I think you've been in this game long enough, Tom, and I certainly have to know that, that by-elections do not uh, replicate themselves at general elections. It's a time for protest. You know, some people will st stay at home and not vote. Some people may be a little bit grumpy with, with the, the party in government, so we'll vote against them. Uh, uh, and sometimes there'll be some tactical voting. We've seen that before. So, you know, I, I won't re read anything into it. If we win, that's great. If we don't win, then we just crack on with the day job and, you know, and try and deliver on the promises the Prime Minister has made to this country. And like I say, two years' time, people in Ash will judge me on my record and the country will judge Boris on his record. Well, Lee Anderson, thank you so much for talking us through all of those different elements of where the Conservative Party is right now. Really appreciate your time this morning. Well, after that vote last night, Boris Johnson spoke to the press, detailing exactly how he felt the day had gone and what needs to happen next. What we need to do now is come together uh, as, a, as a government, as a, as a party, and that is exactly what we can now do. And what this gives us is the opportunity uh, to put behind us uh, all the stuff that I know the, uh, the media have quite you know, properly wanted to focus on for a very long time, uh, and to do our job, which is to focus on uh, the stuff that I think the public actually want us to be talking about. Well, Boris Johnson there, the Prime Minister, speaking after he narrowly won that confidence vote last night. Let's get a view now from the other side of the House of Commons. Christine Jardine is a Liberal Democrat MP for Edinburgh Western. Uh, and welcome to the programme, Christine. I, I, I suppose you must be skipping happy a little bit with how divided the Tories are looking right now. I'm disappointed for the country. Um, I take no joy whatsoever in the country being lumbered with a Prime Minister that so many people have said that they're dissatisfied with because he didn't tell the truth about the parties in Downing Street. And Parliament can't trust him, the country can't trust him. I take no joy in the fact that he has managed to hold on by the skin of his teeth, which is why the Liberal Democrats are today tabling um, a motion of no confidence to give 
all of the MPs in Parliament, all of us who represent people up and down this country who want a Prime Minister in whom they can have faith, who they can trust, and who do not trust Boris Johnson anymore. All the people who have written to us expressing their anger at his disregard and disrespect for them. All of those MPs should have the opportunity to vote on whether we think he's a fitting Prime Minister. Right, well, Christine, I'm sorry, there's a, there seems to be some sort of helicopter going above us right now in Downing Street, but I got the gist of exactly what you were saying. That confidence vote that your, tab that your party is tabling today, it's unlikely to go to a full vote of the House of Commons, isn't it? Well, I think that would, be, that would be very sad if it was, because there is a great deal of anger in the House of Commons, and we've seen that there is also a great deal of anger in, in the Conservative Party, on the Conservative benches, about the way that Boris Johnson has behaved, because he is now he is bringing the Conservative Party into disrepute with the way that he behaved and the lack of respect for the government. He's brought, for the people, sorry, he's brought the government into disrepute, and he's affecting our standing on the international stage at a time when it is critical. And I think, you know, the, the, trying the last straw for, I think, for many people, I think, is trying to rejig the ministerial code because he's broken it. And that, I think, when your own ethics are steps down because he, he can't have any faith in you anymore, then you really are on a, you know, a shiggly, shiggly wicket. Is that a particularly fair point, Christine Jardine? After all, the changes to the ministerial code weren't proposed by the Prime Minister. They were proposed by an independent committee headed by the former head of MI5. This was a change that was uh, proposed in a, in a report that came out long before Partygate and is now being implemented. Terrible timing. Absolutely. I'm with you on that point. But is the Prime Minister really to blame for that? Surprised the Prime Minister didn't realise, you know, when the rest of us all realise that it looks bad at the moment, you know, the Prime Minister didn't think, you know, this looks bad, perhaps I shouldn't do this. He is responsible for the ministerial code and his own ethics are who was appointed by him and who, you know, has responsibility, doesn't have faith in Boris Johnson to abide by not just administer, abide by the ministerial code. And we have seen so many incidents in this this government over the past few years, particularly with the Prime Minister, which in any government with any moral compass at all would have been a resignation issue. And that's the problem that we now have. We have a government in whom the country just does not have faith and a Prime Minister that people are dissatisfied with and feel they can't trust to tell them the truth. Is this really all about party gate, though? I mean, the Prime Minister received one fixed penalty notice for turning up to the Cabinet Room uh, table, standing uh, in his place and looking pretty miserable, holding what I believe is either a can of Coke or a can of Australia. I mean, is, is that really what this Prime Minister should be brought down over? Doesn't that seem to be a little bit out of proportion when we look at all of the issues going on in the world, whether it's sky-high inflation or war uh, on the continent of Europe or, or indeed our, our our NHS backlog off the back of the pandemic. We need a Prime Minister that people can trust, that people can believe in, and that shows leadership. Now, the Sue Gray report was clear that what was going on in Downing Street was unacceptable, that there was a failure of leadership. Now, Boris Johnson sets the tone in Downing Street, in the government, and by extension, in the country with what he does. And we need a Prime Minister that we can have faith will tell us the truth about these things. We will not come to the dispatch box and says he knew nothing about something that it later this, you know, turns out that he was at. Now, it's, it's like anything in life. Once you are discovered to have told a lie, how can anyone have any faith in anything that you say after that? How can they trust you? How can they believe that you're telling them the truth this time? Boris Johnson has no credibility. And what we saw last night was that quite a large percentage, a worrying percentage of him, 40% of his own MPs don't have faith in him. They don't have confidence in him to be the leader of the country. If they don't have confidence in them, why should anybody else?
Christine Jardine, is that not prejudicing the result of uh, the inquiry that is taking place within Parliament right now? The Privileges Committee, of course, looking into whether the Prime Minister did mislead Parliament or not, whether or not he did mislead, uh, he, he did break the ministerial code. It's not, a, it's not a done deal that he did. This is a contentious area. It depends what he knew and when and what he thought of as something legitimate for work and something that wasn't. It seems like there's a large grey area here that the Metropolitan Police themselves spent four months investigating, trying to decide whether or not these individuals had broken the rules. Is there not a grey area there and, and a possibility that the Prime Minister believed he was acting within the rules? You can look at things technically and you can say, well, technically this might have happened or that might have happened. And yes, the Privileged Committee will rule and we will hear what they have to say in time when they've been through things. But the problem that the Prime Minister has is a problem of credibility and of a lack of confidence in him now. As I said, if 40% of his own MPs don't have confidence in him, how can the rest of the country, how can the constituents in those, those seats whose MPs have said that they have no confidence in this Prime Minister? If there's a general election and he's still the leader of the Conservative Party, how do they vote for an MP who doesn't have any confidence in the person that is going to be Prime Minister. And we've got by-elections coming up this month. The voters there will make it clear what they think about Boris Johnson. And what we have seen throughout this, this scandal, because it is a scandal what is going on in the British government, I mean, we, we, you know, it's not acceptable. The behaviour was not acceptable. And what we have seen is people turning away from the, party, the Conservative Party. Lifelong Conservative voters saying we're not going to vote for them anymore. We're not going to vote for them because we can't trust Boris Johnson. And coming to vote for us, we saw it in Chesham and Amersham, we saw it in North Shropshire, and I think we'll see it with the Labour Party in Wakefield, and I think we'll see it in Tiverton and Honington as well. People are fed up with a government that has no respect for them and is completely out of touch with the challenges that they are facing every day, that ordinary families and pensioners up and down this country are facing every day with the cost of living crisis. We've had crisis after crisis in this country for more than two years now. And people need a prime minister that they can have confidence in. Well, we'll certainly look forward to the results of those by-elections on the 23rd of June. Really not long to go now. But for now, Christine Jardine, really appreciate your time this morning on The Briefing. Well, let's swap over back to the other side of the House of Commons now. I'm delighted to be joined by Peter Bone, the MP for Wellingborough, someone who supported the Prime Minister last night. Peter, welcome to the programme. You've been in Parliament for, for two decades now. You've served under five different... Uh, uh, conservative leaders. How did last night's vote feel in comparison to the previous leadership crises that we have seen? Well, I thought uh, there was a convincing win by the Prime Minister last night, um, and it seemed to me the only comparable thing probably was Mrs Thatcher when I wasn't an MP, when she resigned uh, after winning a vote, and, and the Conservative Party suffered for the next 30 years because of that. So Boris had won, the, well, uh, since Mrs Thatcher, the only convincing win in general election has been by Boris Johnson. So the only people that should remove him and the Conservatives is the electorate of the general election. And I'm pleased that the majority, the more significant majority of my colleagues agreed with that view last night. And I suppose there is a, a crucial uh, point here in that Margaret Thatcher, when she faced, faced that vote of confidence, she was challenged, of course, by Michael Heseltine. She won, uh, won the vote, but only 55% to 45%, not by that 15% majority to deny a second round. It went to a second ballot and her cabinet knifed her in the back. Uh, Boris Johnson won by an 18% margin last night, a larger margin than Margaret Thatcher for sure, and, and, and certainly he seems to have the support of his cabinet, but it's undeniable he won by a lesser margin than Theresa May did in 2018. Yeah, I mean, in 2018, it's a different situation. Of course, um, Mrs May had led us into a general election where we'd gone backwards against uh, 
Labour and Jeremy Corbyn. There'd been a national referendum on Brexit and we voted for Brexit, but the Prime Minister, Mrs May, was not introducing Brexit. She was introducing Brexit in name only. She didn't actually resign, of course, uh, over the vote. She was she resigned later on in her premiership when she couldn't get her a Brexit in name only through Parliament. That's what did her in, uh, because she wasn't respecting the views of uh, expressed by the people at a referendum. I think that, that there is a distinct difference between what happened last night and and Theresa May's vote. And, and I suppose that's the distinction between what is valued in this democracy, the, the, the voters, the, the people who elect the MPs, or the MPs. That's that classic question of do we live in a representative democracy or one that is uh, uh, more direct? And, and I suppose that's one of the elements with regard to the discussion yesterday. However, it does seem, looking at various polls, looking at various by-elections, that the Prime Minister isn't best popular with the British public right now. Well, we're mid-term, and um, my experience uh, over the years is that in any government, whatever political co colour, mid-term normally gets way behind in the polls, much more than the Conservatives are behind Labour at the moment. I think we're about six points behind on average. We're not, uh, at mid-term, you'd expect the government to be about 20 points behind, but they often come back and then win at the general election. I mean, it was interesting when real votes were cast in the local elections a few weeks ago that in England, north of Watford, we were actually making gains against Labour. So Labour clearly not a, a government in waiting. And the challenge for the party is clearly going to be, can we solve the economic crisis? If we can do that and we can deal with the migrant crisis and we continue uh, to lead Europe's response in the dread, to the dreadful war in Ukraine, we'll do very well in the next election, but it's a challenge for us, and we in government must, uh, and, and the party must, must knuckle down and sort of that. That's what people on the doorstep in Wales And just finally, Peter Bone, because we don't have long left enough. in this conversation, I do want to ask you, do you believe that the government is on the right track? This is a government that has U-turned a lot, that has raised taxes to their highest level in 72 years, that doesn't seem to have been particularly conservative on a number of issues. Does it need to change? Well, that's, that's what the, the challenge is for the Prime Minister government. I absolutely agree with you. We are taxing too much, and we should, we should reverse that. I would have scrapped the NI increase. We know we're going to have an income tax uh, cut, which is good. But that's, that's what we'll be judged on. It's those issues. It won't be whether there was a mm. Tupperware cake of, uh, given to the Prime Minister for, for nine minutes. No, it's the real issues that will be decided upon. And the Prime Minister needs to take note of what you've just said and to deal with those issues, and let's get taxation down. Well, Peter Bone, thank you so much for joining us this morning on The Briefing. Really appreciate your time and your perspective there, as always. Um, finally, in the programme, we can now turn to Marco Longhi, MP, uh, uh, 2019 uh, intake, but also the UK's trade envoy to Brazil. And he joins us now from Rio de Janeiro. Uh, Marco, I believe you voted by proxy last night, um, but you decided to back the Prime Minister. Why was that? Uh, because he is the Prime Minister that delivered an 80-seat majority. He is the reason why I uh, became elected in a seat that's never been Conservative before. He is the man with the vision, and he is the man with whom I have the greatest confidence in solving the challenges moving forward, as he has proven to lead the country out of COVID, and how he is proving leading the Western Hemisphere uh, with regards to the uh, aggression shown by Russia in Ukraine. And you're currently in Brazil, no doubt speaking with uh, senior business leaders and indeed politicians, looking for the UK's post-Brexit trade agenda. Is this something that the government can actually get on with, getting on with those issues to uh, cut the cost of, of trade, to, to make goods and services cheaper for people in the United Kingdom, deal with that cost of living crisis? Is this a government that can do that, or is it simply too divided and too distracted? Uh, that is the reason why I'm in Brazil, Tom. Uh, yesterday, one of my uh, four or five engagements was with a number of senior uh, Brazilian Navy admirals. Uh, we are looking to secure, through a defence uh, partnership agreement, uh, 
a deal that could be as much as a, a billion pounds. This means more jobs for British people. It means more secure jobs uh, for British people. And it means growth for the British economy. And it'll be through these actions and other actions and challenges that I know that the Prime Minister is up to to deal with the cost of living uh, for uh, ordinary people on a day-to-day -day basis. What I would like to see in addition to that is an affordable uh, energy policy while still maintaining our trajectory for a, a greening uh, uh, of, of the economy. Uh, but we need to also face up to the fact that people are facing up to difficulties here and now. Well, Marco, thank you so much for joining us all the way from Rio de Janeiro. It's been a, a real pleasure to hear what you have to say, not just on the issues, of course, yesterday in Parliament, but looking forward to the future as well. That cost of living crisis, really, really important. Thanks for joining us. Well, that's been it for the briefing today. I've been Tom Harwood, live from Downing Street. Of course, I'll be reporting throughout the day here as the Cabinet meeting goes on and further developments, no doubt, take place. That's it for the briefing, though. Up next, it's to the point with Patrick and Mercy. But first, here's the weather. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, in that the left fights the right and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was in fact a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. Yeah. <laughs> We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to 